Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and here at part of our Think Tech series, we bring uh, informed perspectives, uh, subject matter experts, and a range of global issues. Uh, today I'm joined by two young leaders that are going to give us some valuable insights into a range of issues in Asia, particularly security related. Uh, I'm joined today by two, uh, and I'm going to have them say a few words about them themselves. I'm joined by Crystal Pryor and Myla Plan. And Crystal and, and Myla, please welcome to Global Connections. Thank you for joining us today. Look forward to a conversation. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, at the outset is maybe have a chance to tell us a few words about yourself, your background. Both of you are here in Honolulu as uh, visiting uh, fellows, uh, scholars that are doing research here at Pacific Forum, CSIS, a uh, foreign policy think tank based here in Hawaii. Uh, but you've come uh, from, you know, with a wealth of background and experience. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you're doing here at the moment, and perhaps starting with you, Miley. Sure. Um, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I graduated from La Pietra. Oh, okay. um, and the Hawaii School for Girls, as yes, it's Hawaii School for Girls. Known. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I went to Whitman College where I got an, East, mm -hmm. uh, an Asian Studies uh, major. Mm -hmm. okay. um, studied abroad in Beijing. And then I started working for Senator Inouye. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the Washington office? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. In his Washington, D.C. office. Yes. And then later his President Pro Tem office. Okay. Um, before also working for Senator Schatz. Okay. Um, and I also received a master's degree from Georgetown while I was in Washington, D.C., and then I'm here now. And you're here. So in many ways, uh, coming back, a young leader from Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, had some great experience in Washington and Oregon. Is this where you were studying in college? Uh, Whitman. Uh, Whitman, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so great, uh, great to learn, and, and as we'll learn about the work you're doing, say, say just a brief word about what is your topic of, of study and, and research here at Pacific Forum. Um, so at the Pacific Forum, I am currently researching on maritime security in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, so specifically about anti-piracy issues okay. um, that are currently happening in the Malacca Straits. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. And we'll turn to Crystal. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what, what brings you here to, to Hawaii. Sure. Well, actually, this is my first time on Oahu, and I got here a week and a half ago, so it's quite exciting discovering all there is to offer here. Mm -hmm. I, my background, I kind of grew up on both coasts, and I ended up going to university on the East Coast, but I'd been studying Japanese all through high school on the West Coast, and so I continued studying Japanese, which ended up bringing me to Japan during university. I loved it, fell in love with it, didn't want to go back to school, but <laughs> my dad said to get my BA and then I could do whatever I wanted. So I graduated with a degree in international relations and then moved to Japan uh, directly after I finished college. And so I lived there actually for a total of six years consecutively after university, and then I've been back uh, for different research projects for six months and four months since then. So I spent a lot of time in Japan, and I was offered the opportunity to come here and do research at Pacific Forum mm -hmm. related to my dissertation, my current dissertation topic, but also mm -hmm. other research that I'm interested in doing and, and moving forward. So that's how I ended up here. Great. And you're a doctoral candidate at the University of Washington. Yes. Uh, excellent. And, and then the long experience you had in Japan, were really a deep immersion, has I'm sure given you a lot of valuable insights into both that culture and society, how they see and think. And this is so important for us as young leaders. You know, you have to get out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. leave, you know, whatever your home might be and, and, and have those opportunities. And now both of you are coming back and obviously engaged uh, in, in, in you know, ongoing research. And Pacific Forum, of course, an important uh, you know, organization here, well connected to, throughout the region of Asia, a lot of policy issues. And uh, that's what we'll speak to today here. We're joined by two young leaders who I think will give us what I want to say are some fresh perspectives. Because these, you know, many of these challenges that we're dealing with are, have been longstanding, they're enduring, they've got a long historical context. Uh, and all too often, I think a lot of the leaders who deal with them are usually just very old white men that uh, often have a view maybe shaped by their own you know, generation, their experience growing up as many, you know, let's say, older generations did in the Cold War. We have a different world today that is obviously changing rapidly, and especially those of you uh, who've had opportunities. You, you spent some time in China yourself doing studies, and in Japan, you know, you, you, you get a different perspective when you, when you have that experience. And so drawing from that, I, I guess I wanted to begin maybe, uh, you know, we can, what we'll do is try, take, take an opportunity to look more in depth at each of your respective areas. And so, Miley, you were telling us briefly some of your work focuses really on security issues in Southeast Asia, maritime uh, policy, maritime security, piracy issues. And, you know, when we hear that term piracy, oh, you just have this image of, you know, somehow a Johnny Depp movie or something. But obviously this is a very real and serious issue. And, and that region, particularly the Malacca Straits, one of the key sort of choke points of, of commerce and trade that passes through there. Uh, the you know, global economy depends on that, and yet you have a, a challenge because there are 
piracy issues. T tell us a little bit what, what type of problems there are and you know, what are some of the challenges of dealing with it because it, it, it presents a real uh, challenge. Sure. Um, so as you have mentioned, the Malacca Straits do, um, there's I think trillions of dollars of money, billions of fuel, um, lots of different uh, commodities going through the Malacca mm -hmm. Strait. And so there was, um, the piracy issue has actually never, it's not a really new thing. It's always mm -hmm. been going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was um, a concerted effort by the littoral states, Singapore, Malaysia, um, as well as um, uh, or no, and then no. Indonesia, yeah, to kind of uh, patrol mm -hmm. the area. Um, and the piracy issues did actually go down for mm -hmm. a few uh, years, and yeah. recently they've actually come back up. Mm -hmm. um, and just uh, as well, while the Malacca Strait piracy is coming up, it's interesting to note that the Somali pirates are actually going down, the mm -hmm. incidences. This is in East Africa, um, another mm -hmm. place that's had a, a very That also high. has piracy. Yes. And it's fascinating because you know, when you look at these these ships that go through these, these are huge, massive container ships for the mm -hmm. most part. And you know the idea of a pirate just coming up and tackling this massive thing, but it is real. I mean, they do have obviously capacity to do that. Uh, I'm reminding of a, of a Tom Hanks movie about the the, the piracy issue in, in, in East Africa there. But um, the other thing I think it speaks to is uh, we see in the region of Asia, especially. Uh, these are challenges that require cooperation, coordination, mm -hmm. working together, and you know, at different times, previous you know, decades perhaps, you didn't have as much of that happening. Today, we, we've got a longer period now where these governments have had to work together, find some mm -hmm. solutions. It's not without its tensions and difficulties, because uh, of course there is that, but nevertheless, I think it speaks to a growing sort of either interdependence that, that is, you know, uh, if we can call it that, or maybe just a growing need for collaboration, and, mm -hmm. and when you on this particular issue, I mean, one of the things I'm curious is, uh, are there, I don't know, uh, issues that, you know, make it hard for them to cooperate, whether it has to do with their political systems or, I don't know, just, you know, even uh, issues that may relate to international law, who's responsible? I mean, what are some of the kind of, very briefly, some of the challenges of, of dealing with mm -hmm. piracy issues? Um, so one uh, big example would probably be the definition of pirates. Mm -hmm. So in, according to international law by the United Nations, um, piracy incidents um, basically is defined as if um, there's a hijacking or a smuggling of some kind that's outside of territorial waters. Mm -hmm. But the Straits of Malacca are basically claimed by, yes. you know, And that's one of the states. challenges, that there's yeah. not a clear agreement on which part belongs to who, right? Exactly. So basically, mm -hmm. for some, they say it's actually armed robbery. For some, they say it's piracy. Mm -hmm. So there's also that kind of um, yes. definitional issue. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is also has to do with interagency cooperation as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So for example, on some of the patrols, um, some ships can actually uh, like chase after you know pir suspected piracy. Yeah. But once they enter certain territorial waters, they can't actually go mm. continue That's pursuing right. them. Yeah, yeah. So there are issues like that as well. Yes. Um, the ones that I'm looking at specifically are about the piracy incidents that are happening to the tankers that are going through the Malacca mm -hmm. Strait. There were a significant increase um, from last year to this year with the tanker increases, and some say it could be because of you know the increase in fuel prices. But now that the fuel prices have gone down, we're not sure. And I'm just curious. I mean, when you think of a you know a pirate taking on a tanker, I mean, mm -hmm. are they stealing the whole boat? Are they stealing the contents of it? Are they just uh, <laughs> what is what is what are they going mm -hmm. after? Because it's not you know again these are not insignificant boats. They're yeah. huge tankers. So um, yeah, when I first read about <laughs> it, I was very intrigued because yeah. I was thinking, sh surely like how can that be possible? Yeah. But what happens is that they um, basically go. The incidents happen in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. um, and they don't. They're not after the super tankers. They're after mm. more of the smaller tankers, yeah. which yeah. makes sense. Sure. Um, and what they do is they, the tanker is sitting on the water because it's quite low as a mm. tanker, and they have another one coming right by it, so okay. they siphon off the fuel. And sometimes it could take a few hours, and sometimes they could be missing for a week. So they do steal the, yep. the, the, the materials, and then that, that can resell, and obviously mm -hmm. that's what they're doing. Yeah, again, it just seems so amazing because it's not mm -hmm. like the days of pirates where it was like, a similar size ship. I mean, you're taking a small boat that's going after a massive tanker. And as you touched on, I mean, uh, the issues are very complex. You know, international mm -hmm. law and defining you know, who has control or sovereignty, and and then just the question of even you know coordinating among these different mm -hmm. you know law enforcement and, uh, and otherwise militaries. Very interesting stuff, and uh, very critical for us to understand because again, it, it relates to uh, you know both the flow of commerce and even more than that, just relations between these countries that can mm -hmm. sometimes spiral into conflict and tensions, and that can play out in other areas. So. You 
want to try to solve this issue, and everyone, I think, has an interest in doing so. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, as we continue our, our talk, Crystal, we want to turn briefly for you to give us a snapshot of some of your work. Uh, you've got a focus on uh, some different areas related to, uh, you know, security and, 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 and issues with particularly Japan. And tell us, in a nutshell, again, what, what is the focus of your current studies? Sure. My current research for the Pacific Forum is looking at the recent changes that are happening around Japan's arms exports and the mm -hmm. rules that are surrounding that. But mm -hmm. that's actually informed by my own dissertation research, which is more broadly on strategic trade. And I'm doing a comparative study for my dissertation mm -hmm. on France, the UK, and Japan, and looking at their practices around how they are trying to control exports of sensitive technologies. And mm -hmm. a class of, of technologies called dual-use technologies, which basically are created for civil or commercial purposes, but then have really important military implications. Mm -hmm. um, so building off of that research. Yeah. Now you mentioned Jap Japan arms exports. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, most people don't think of that sure. as Japan sure. exporting arms. Well, what exactly sure. are they doing, or, and who, sure. who buys them? What, what is the nature of their Absolutely. world? I mean, I think part of the problem is that even most Japanese citizens aren't aware <laughs> of these changes that are happening, yeah, which I yeah. think is actually a major issue right now. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that nothing's actually really happened yet, so that's part of it. Mm -hmm. This is just a policy level change at the moment, okay. and there haven't been actually movements. but. Basically, Japan had self-imposed a ban on exporting any kind of arms, any kind of lethal weapons, at around the end of World War II. It wasn't quite after, but a few mm -hmm. years afterwards. And they've basically stuck to that policy until today, ex with the very notable exception of working together with the United States and on military things, and particularly mm -hmm. ballistic missile defense. Mm -hmm. So that's been an important exception, and I, in my proposed and sort of future research, I am looking at the role of the U.S.-Japan alliance in the current mm -hmm. changes that are happening in Japan. But some of the things that are under consideration right now, a really important one is collaboration on submarines with Australia. And if Japan is going to be able to export that or even just collaborate with Australia on building new submarines, that, mm -hmm. that's a big issue yeah. right now. And it's all part, really, of a very important change that's happening in China. I'm sorry, in Japan, uh, under the leadership now of the current government, uh, there's been a real rethinking of redefining its, you know, its its capacity and even the constitution itself. Um, you know, we're going to uh, look a little more in depth at that in a moment because I think it speaks to both changes happening in Japan and, you know, many years have passed now since the end of the World War II, and it's now kind of wanting to assert a new a role in the world. Um, and moreover, it's tied in very closely with the alliance with the United States. We've had a long time one since the end of the war, uh, and that, you know, want to speak a little bit to how, what does that actually mean, and, and from the perspective of the U.S., what are our interests in that? We'd like to see Japan be, you know, a responsible and, and you know, key player, but uh, there are probably some concerns in, in parts of the U.S., uh, uh, you know, sort of foreign policy establishment. What, what, what are those concerns? So uh, I think what we'll do is uh, we're going to have a short break for a moment to continue more on our conversation, uh, a chance to learn and really get some good perspectives that both of you are sort of, you know, experienced scholars who are, you know, both in the field understanding, you know, uh, from the, you know, and that's important to, you know, get yourself in the, in the perspective of, of these, uh, you know, uh, these different countries. Uh, but now as you're here as, as, as research fellows, have, having a chance to reflect, uh, to share, to, you know, disseminate more knowledge about this, it's important for us to share it with our viewers here. So let me suggest we're going to take a one-minute break. We'll come right back and, and continue with more on the story. We're joined here today, uh, and, and we'll be right back. Thank you. Hi, Jay. Hi, my Keith. Name's, <laughs> my name's Keith Bettinger. I knew that. And I'm the host of Think Tech Asia. I knew that, too. Here on Think Tech. Fabulous. Um, You've got a great show going, thank Keith. Thank you very much. And for uh, our viewers out there that are interested in Think Tech Asia, it airs every Tuesday from 4 to 4. 4:45, and uh, it can be accessed online at thinktech.com. Yeah. So, what kind of guests do you like? Well, we have a, a number of guests from from academia, uh, from uh, practitioners of international affairs. Sometimes we have uh, military officials. Sometimes we have public officials on the show. And our goal, uh, we try to talk about. Uh, current issues in South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Central Asia, all throughout the Asian realm, in more depth than you would find in traditional mainstream. That's media. the difference, isn't it? Exactly. That you're you're reaching out beyond what ordinary news media would do. Right. We're and trying. That's to, why we like you so much. We're trying to provide a, a thinking person's perspective, an intelligent perspective on what's going on, and where both sides of the story, or even when there's more than two sides, we try to cover every angle. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, one of the big benefits that we provide here at ThinkTech, is it's a really innovative source of educational programming for the people of Hawaii. You're great, Keith. You're, you are a great host. You've got a great show going on. 
I watch it every week. Thanks very much. Why don't Jim. you guys watch it every week too, okay? 4:45 to uh, 4 to 4:45 every Tuesday. <laughs> Aloha, welcome. We're back and we're live. We're here on Global Connections, part of the Think Tech Hawaii series. And we're joined today by two young research scholars who are fellows here at the Pacific Forum, CSIS, which is a Honolulu-based foreign policy research institute, a think tank, and closely connected, affiliated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Uh, Crystal Pryor is here uh, as one of the SPF fellows, and yes. we want to say a word about what that really means. Uh, of course, uh, Pacific Forum brings uh, regular uh, you know, uh, cohorts of, of research fellows, and many of them are sponsored by different uh, fellowships. And in your case, Miley, you're a Vasey fellow. So maybe real quickly just tell us, uh, you're an SPF fellow, but sure. what does that stand for? Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Okay. It's a Tokyo-based foundation that um, basically has been providing money to funding to the Pacific Forum since 2010 mm -hmm. to have people come in here, one U.S. citizen, one Japanese citizen each mm -hmm. year gets to come yeah. and work on issues related to the U.S.-Japan alliance. Yeah, and, and again, we'll speak a little bit more to that itself because it's a very important, uh, especially here from Hawaii uh, where we've got a you know clear link to Asia, but the U.S.-Japan relationship, very important, and yet it's evolving as, as some sure. of your work is going to speak to in a moment. Uh, and Maile, you're a Vesey fellow, and Vesey, of course, speaks to uh, the founder of Pacific Forum himself, and, and uh, what anything else you would add to that? I mean. Uh, um, I think that speaks for itself yes, that he was one of them, that's um, right. and so basically, this fellowship uh, provides for a resident fellow to look into U.S. Asia security policy that's issues. That's right. Yeah, and, and Admiral Joe Vasey, who uh, uh, still going strong here in Hawaii, and, and we see from time to time at some of our events. Uh, well, Becca, Crystal, we were speaking just a moment about your your recent work, and 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 you know what what I'm wanting to get a quick sense and, and share with our viewers here is, you know, Japan, the U.S. Uh, it's a relationship that has been you know very strong, uh, an alliance uh, that has been now in place. Uh, many decades, and yet it's at a time now where it's kind of coming under some, uh, you know, rethinking, sure. particularly from the side of Japan. You've spent many years there, and now uh, your own work now speaks to, you know, some of the changes. Uh, under the current uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe, mm -hmm. he is rethinking, you know, and, and, and the other issues, maybe say a word or two about you know, Japan and their constitution and how that has either constrained what they can do and sure. some of the thinking to try to redefine that relationship. Uh, tell us a little bit about Japan and from your vantage point, you know, where we are now is a very interesting critical juncture, a rethinking and, and wanting to assert itself in, in different ways. Sure. Well, actually, when I first went to Japan to study abroad, that was when Japanese citizens and the government were essentially deciding whether or not to send their SDF, their self-defense forces, mm -hmm. abroad to do logistical support mm -hmm. in the Indian Ocean for the first time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really the first activity besides peacekeeping operations. Yeah. And, uh, uh, that is in part because they've had a constraint. The yes. Constitution says yes. you, you know, they cannot have like yes. a, you know, let's say armies going exactly. around the world. Exactly. Article yeah. 9 of their so-called peace constitution prohibits mm -hmm. them from engaging in war or, or actually having a standing army yeah. um, is how it's interpreted. And so I've sort of been following mm -hmm. Japan since then and Japan's security policy mm -hmm. since then. So it's been quite interesting actually over the past I guess 10, 15 years now mm -hmm. at this point to, mm -hmm. to understand what's been happening, what's been changing. And so I think to some degree what we're seeing now is a continuation of these movements that have been happening ever since the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And so in the broader scope, but there is something to be said about what's been happening under the Abe administration mm -hmm. specifically. Yeah. I think the U.S.-Japan alliance is as strong as ever and mm -hmm. the revised um, U.S.-Japan the security guidelines as well should attest to the fact that both countries see it as the most important security alliance in the, in the Pacific. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any change there, but I do think that it feels that things have accelerated since mm -hmm. um, Prime Minister Abe came into power. And I think what's really important for me and the thing that I would like to convey is that this is not necessarily being driven by any real change in public opinion. Mm -hmm. I think for the first time ever, maybe in the past five years or so, and particularly with what's been going on with China and the disputes over territory and territorial waters, that for the first time ever, I think the Japanese public is maybe starting to seriously consider China as a threat, mm -hmm. but that's really been over the past five years. And so mm -hmm. I don't think that these changes are directly driven by sort of a public push for more mm -hmm. militarization, but that it's really top down. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's important to get across. And even when I was looking at my some of the background work for this changes in the arms export rules, over 65% of the public don't support these changes. And so this is not a popularly driven movement. This is yeah. very um, executive government led. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's an important thing to note. And so I think with the constitution, we're just not gonna be seeing a lot of change. You need a two thirds um, 
vote from the public to change anything in the Constitution, yeah, which, I yeah. mean, is just unthinkable. Yeah, very big hurdle to come yes. over. And, uh, and yet it's been a conversation for some years now. Absolutely. Again, as you described, you know, uh, the challenge of allowing Japanese to deploy outside. I have a recollection many years back in the early uh, 90s when uh, there was a conflict in the Persian Gulf War, the first one, and, and I recall Japan getting criticized. They, they just wrote a check and put it in the mail, and there was a sense, wait, you know, you're a, you know, an important global power, you need to do a little more, and you fast forward to the more, uh, maybe a decade ago, the intervention into Iraq uh, by the U.S. overthrowing the regime. Uh, Japan took on a little more active role, and, and what, in the gist of it, what, what, what was it that they did in that more recent um, intervention? They supported with, like, engineers or hospitals, I, I can't remember. Yes, they were helping primarily with refueling okay. efforts, but yeah. they sent all branches. I think the number was 22,000, actually, yeah. in total, over so, 2001 to 2000. That's so quite a, a pretty significant, quite a I mean, you know, again, uh, unprecedented in, yes. in the post-war period. But again, also underscoring Japan, you know, as a key and, you know, uh, one of the large powers and having that capacity, there was a sense of, well, you got to, you know, share some of the burden. Sure. Sure. Uh, and now I think that experience is probably helping them rethink, okay, what can we do? And then maybe it's in these areas of, I don't know, it could be disaster management, it could be, you know, dealing with, you know, uh, crises. Uh, it does raise, you know, again, I guess, concerns and flags up because there are a lot of tensions in that region. You've got the Korean Peninsula, which is of considerable interest to Japan, and Japan, of course, uh, I've always found it curious, you know, on that um, challenge with uh, Korea and the, during the six-party talks, they seem to just be obsessed with one single thing, which is, you know, give us back our people that you've kidnapped. And, and you know, where the other ones are dealing with, you know, the challenge of nuclear weapons, um, you know, Japan has you know, obviously a very sore point uh, uh, over their relationship with North Korea. Uh, beyond that, again, it's just an area that has, uh, as we see here, with maritime issues and, and uh, you know, the importance of trade and commerce. Uh, and then Japan probably feeling now like it's kind of ready to, do its own and, and, and this relationship where for so many decades the U.S. kind of helped to, sure. you know, in some ways define that agenda. Now they're probably asserting a little more autonomy on their own. But as you made clear, I mean, the relationship remains very strong. It is one of our, you know, most important uh, uh, alliances. And uh, I think it speaks to a lot of things related to issues of foreign policy where sometimes they're very complex, you know, export control. And, and you know, the public just isn't always aware or interested in, you know, those details. Uh, they want to know the bottom line, what does this mean? Are we, you know, is it going to, how does this affect us? But uh, uh, you made a good point about how maybe these changes don't really reflect somehow pressure from below, but it's the leadership in Japan. And, you know, the Japanese political system, always a curiosity for those of us. I teach it myself about comparative politics, and it's fascinating, even though we have a very strong prime minister at the moment. I mean, you, you look at the last four or five decades, Japan has a tradition of changing prime ministers quite often, uh, and, you know, and yet the country maintains very stable, very, uh, you know, strong political system. And I think what it speaks to in my mind is the power of the institutions themselves, the bureaucracies, the ministries that have a lot of continuity. Uh, maybe from your vantage point, I mean, what would you say uh, on that point about Japan's political system that makes it, you know, distinct or different, and, and what we as Americans should think about in trying to understand, make sense of Japan and how it works? That's interesting. Yeah. I think the fact that Japan has a parliamentary system is huge, and it's as an American, you don't really understand why the leader is not elected, but he's mm -hmm. not. He's not directly That's elected. Right. He's the head of the leading party in yes. the parliament, and yes. so it's another thing to think about when we're thinking about does Abe actually represent public popular opinion in Japan, yeah. not necessarily. Right. He represents the leading party in Japan, yes. which of course is elected. So I think that's a sort mm -hmm. of a basic thing to note. The bureaucracy in Japan is incredibly strong, mm -hmm. and that's being chipped away slowly mm -hmm. over the years, and in part, uh, it's definitely been a push on the political side to reduce the bureaucracy's mm -hmm. power. So I mean, it's, it's sort of on purpose in some ways, yeah. but e even then, the bureaucracy still maintains a huge amount of power. Also, the legal system in Japan is quite mm -hmm. interesting interesting and not definitely not my field of specialty but yeah. it's extremely difficult to change or revise a yeah. law yeah. and so that presents actually for in the good sense it presents a lot of continuity yeah. and yeah, stability, stability but at the same time it's very difficult when you need to be making changes to export control laws yes, for example yes. the myriad problems that, that come up yeah so that. again it's very important to understand when you're dealing with the countries bilateral multilateral you need to understand the inner workings of the political system how is it set up how are decisions made and the nature of their parliamentary system which is critical to understand uh, and here again I think it's fair to say we have a current leader who's back he had been a prime minister at the previous time but he seems to have a pretty strong, uh, you know, mandate and, and, and a very, you know, strong set of reforms and ideas. But 
tackling that is not easy. The, the nature of the system, the, the culture itself is one of, you know, very you know, thinking carefully about any changes, making sure, you know, this, uh, how does it impact the group and, and so on. But uh, very important for us to continue understanding and grateful that someone like you who's been immersed in that country and, and its culture and society can help inform us about that. Uh, and maybe Miley will turn to you. You, you yourself had uh, previous experience, um, you know, particularly working in, in uh, sorry, studying in, in, in Beijing and in China, uh, and more recently, uh, before coming out this way, you had some experience working in our Congress, our legislature, the uh, the Senate, um, with the offices of Senator, former Senator Daniel Inouye and Brian Schatz. Tell us a little bit about that experience and how it's helped shape, you know, some of your intellectual development and, and maybe how it's informed what you're doing now. Um, so working, uh, when I was in Beijing, I took a class on governing China. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know much about the governance system of China. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely very eye-opening for yes. me and understanding how um, they make legislation, how they work, uh, mm -hmm. how they think of legislation, and also how they think of American legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and working for Senator Inouye and Senator Schatz, I also got to see how policy is made in D.C., mm -hmm. um, specifically um, defense policy, foreign policy, energy mm -hmm. security. Mm -hmm. So I got a very broad sense of um, how you know laws are made, how it's, um, I guess, how it kind of works within mm -hmm. the budget. Like, for example, the budget um, debate that's coming up right now, mm -hmm. um, what that's like <laughs> in D.C. Yes. Um, and I remember, I think, the first year that Senator Schatz was there, when I was working for him, we were on furlough. Um, oh. so and that included your pay? Uh, of oh, course. No. So <laughs> yeah, but Senator Schatz himself actually, um, you know, started answering phones so that he can understand <laughs> what's going on as well. So he buy you any yeah. free lunches, maybe? Or? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, they're both senators were, you know, very immersed with what's affecting Hawaii mm -hmm. um, and making sure that any federal legislation does not adversely affect our state. Mm -hmm. um, it's often overlooked because yeah. they just don't know the unique uh, situation sometimes That's that we right. have. Yeah, and uh, you know, we have to remind people even something like Pacific Forum. I mean, Hawaii is is, of course, beautiful sand and beaches, but it's a very important uh, connection for the U.S. to Asia and the Pacific, mm -hmm. and very important organizations like Pacific Forum and many others who really do a lot to both bring together, you know, talented and, you know, experts, uh, and to shape policy. And, and the, the work done at Pacific Forum, we often describe it as a form of uh, sort of track two diplomacy, track one and a half, and what that means is that there is a vital role for think tanks in, in our system. And what it tells me, too, is, you know, just as you have to understand the countries you're dealing with in Asia, uh, those countries need a, an understanding of our system of government. And it's not always obvious or easy to understand, uh, when, especially when you see the headlines and the ranklings that are going on, uh, as you, you know, I've shared with you before. I mean, I have a lot of connections with Mexico, and people there are looking at the current presidential debates and saying, Donald Trump, is he going to be the next president? And well, try to say, well, probably not. But on the other hand, he's garnering the headlines, and what he's saying is not pleasing too many Mexicans. A few of them are, but most of them are a little bit insulted. But it just means, you know, we really need a deeper understanding of these issues. Uh, and now that you've had both you know, opportunities to learn about China, about Southeast Asia, about Japan, uh, I'm curious as you turn the tables and say, you know, when you're in there and you spend a lot of time in Japan, I mean, you are effectively a cultural ambassador. You're explaining our world over here, our system of government, our society, and likewise, you travel and spend time in China and, you know, you're learning about their system, but you're also there explaining about our world, about Hawaii, about the U.S., about the Congress. Uh, I wonder maybe very briefly if you could share any thoughts. I mean, how do people in Japan or in other parts of Asia, how do they perceive our system of government? What are the, I don't know, puzzles or quirks that come to their mind that you have to often explain or, or maybe you can't explain it. The Electoral College, how do we elect a president? Even Americans don't realize we don't have a direct election, but uh, beyond that, it's really, we also have a myriad of so many stakeholders and players, you know, private interests, you know, industry, that clearly you have to understand where they fit into that picture. Any thoughts on, again, explaining the puzzle of American politics and policy to people in Asia? I was once hired to do a project explaining the U.S. health care insurance system to Japanese people, and that mm -hmm. was <laughs> getting yes. to the point where I could speak about that in Japanese to yeah. a foreign audience was uh, <laughs> quite the challenge. Yes. And, I mean, even now, I, I can't say that I'm an expert in it because it's mm -hmm. just, it's so complicated. And so trying to explain that and what was happening with the reforms and the changes, mm -hmm. but I think that's just sort of a microcosm of how complicated our government is. Yeah. And, in my field and other fields, you have so many different agencies working together, plus mm -hmm. you have Congress, plus you have sort of public opinion and how that fits into mm -hmm. all of it. So yeah. it's, I, I don't even profess to be able to explain all of these things, but I, I 
try to, if nothing else, express the complexity of the situations mm -hmm. and also that Americans are so diverse and yeah. that we have so many different perspectives on these things. But so. ultimately, again, you're not an expert, but you're finding yourself continually having to explain <laughs> that and people want to know how does it work, what is that, and so you don't realize it, but you have to become an expert even if it's not your right. primary focus. You've got to be able to explain and articulate and sometimes it means not knowing how to explain. Just say, well, it's a little puzzling, but that's how it is. Any quick thoughts yourself on, again, sharing explanations about how our system works or the quirks of our political mm -hmm. and Process. Sure. So um, a lot of folks in China don't n understand how the three branches of government work. Mm -hmm. um, so I did spend quite a lot of time explaining that mm -hmm. in Congress um, we, you know, pass the legislation and the presidency really enforces it. But I also had to explain that in Congress we don't just have one legislative body; yeah. we have two the legislative two bodies. And they so have to they exactly. And, so then um, yeah. I think we had to explain like how it passes through committee, and then how it mm -hmm. has to go onto the floor, and then both has to agree, yeah. and then of course there's a constitutional check on it by the Supreme Court. Yes. So there are many um, confusion, confusing yeah. um, notions on that, and um, so. And I think yeah. even so, I'm not sure I fully explained it <laughs> well enough so that they understand yeah, because yeah. for them in the Chinese governance system, it's very different yeah. for how they make laws and That's stuff. Right. Um, especially the dissenting voices that we have in Congress yeah. is very yeah. um, interesting sure. for a lot of them. And mm -hmm. again, just to sh underscores the sharp differences in the different political systems, but we have to understand them, they have to understand us, and that's part of it. Uh, we're going to continue with more on our story. We're joined here today by two young scholars here at Pacific Forum, CSIS, uh, Crystal Pryor and Maile Plan, and they're going to talk a little bit more about some issues related to security in the Asia region. We'll be back with more on the story in just a moment. Aloha, this is Alice Lee Hagen from ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show is a bi-weekly show on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. We invite interesting people, entrepreneurs, fascinating leaders who contribute to the social economic well-being of our state. Please tune in to my show, Business Education Spotlight, ThinkTech Hawaii, bi-weekly, Thursday, 3 to 4 p.m. Aloha. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward uh, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back. We're live here on Think Tech Hawaii's Global Connection Show. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, joined today by two young leaders who are really able to give us some fresh insights, some new perspectives on issues related to security throughout Asia, the East Asia, Southeast Asia. We're joined by Crystal Pryor, who comes here uh, at Pacific Forum. She's a SPF fellow uh, and as well a PhD student uh, finishing her dissertation work at the University of Washington. Uh, and uh, we're joined by Miley Plan. And Miley is a Vasey fellow uh, working on a range of East Asia security issues, particularly maritime policy in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, you know, as we've been talking a little bit about, you know, sort of the, what are the challenges, you know, as, as researchers yourself, you focus on your narrow areas you know you know a lot about certain things and that's important we need that expertise uh, but as you're relating that and telling it to others and you know briefing it as you're traveling as you've done and spent time in Asia uh, you find yourself often having to explain to them other things and as we said a moment ago I mean you know you like it or not you have to be experts on American politics and policy explaining you know how it fits in uh, so that those uh, you know foreign countries will understand our system and it's not always easy uh, we have a very complex one many you know as you just described the separation of our powers uh, and often um, you know uh, very raucous things I'm thinking you know when you think of a country like China which has a you know fairly authoritarian system especially related to foreign policy I mean it's a pretty clearly defined by the leadership uh, for us we have many voices and that can be confusing you know they might hear some statement by a senator or some other you know interest group that suddenly what does that mean 
Um, I'm curious, maybe from your experiences in, in Asia, uh, if you might relate any other anecdotes of some of the puzzles people have about understanding us and, you know, what, as Americans, we also have to, because I often tell people when you spend time abroad, you learn about those places that you go in the culture, but you also learn about your country and your home a lot more, uh, and you find yourself thinking about that. Maybe if you can turn back, uh, Miley, to your experience again uh, as, a, as a student uh, in Beijing. Uh, you went there and studied things, but you found yourself having to explain, and, and moreover, you've got a Hawaii connection, and that's always interesting either as an icebreaker, but also you have to explain to people it's not just the beautiful, you know, vacation resort that it is, but it's a very important place for many other things. So maybe just tell us a little bit as a, as a young, you know, growing up here in Hawaii, going to the mainland, finding yourself in China, what are some reflections on, on that experience? Um, well, first of all, I think America is a very diverse country. Mm -hmm. Um, which is very shocking to many uh, Chinese people yeah. because, uh, of course, they don't have that many immigration uh, in the country. So I often have to also explain to them that I am not a Chinese citizen, mm -hmm. that I am, in fact, an American citizen. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is that, as you mentioned, um, we have to understand them just as much as they would need to understand mm -hmm. us. And I realized as I was traveling through China that we am, in America do focus a lot of attention on um, the East China Sea, the South China Sea. Um, and for many people that are in the western part of China, they're not very concerned yes, about right. maritime the Taiwan issues. Issue. Are not yeah. a, uh, unless um, it's the river nearby, but that's very mm -hmm. different. Yeah, so they're more mm -hmm. concerned about um, like security issues that are on the ground, like trafficking or smuggling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or issues in Central Asia or with Russia mm -hmm. and things yeah. like that. So it's very different if you travel throughout the country. And mm -hmm. not. Um, it's interesting that the landmass of China is actually quite large, mm -hmm. um, but they all only have one time zone. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, there's you know just interesting that. things like that yeah. that um, surprised me. But the the history of China was very interesting because you can really see how they think, um, mm -hmm. how they look at the world, yeah. how yeah. they even look at government based mm -hmm. on their history. And on my sense, uh, again, I certainly don't pretend to be a China expert, but I have studied a fair amount and visited a few times, and I just that point you make about history that for them it's like there's no rush you know we'll, we you know we have a long historical track record we've been around a while we'll be there and so th they take time the concept of time you have to be able to understand what it might mean for them that could be different uh, and lastly I think uh, very well put in terms of you know here's a country that while you know their leadership and even today the dynamism is tends to be found in those eastern cities very you know you know dynamic places uh, Beijing Shanghai but so much of China is not that it's in you know the interior and different interests different issues but we need to understand those too because those are what are shaping its development and its opportunities and challenges uh, and so it requires us to kind of dig a little deeper beyond just the sort of the, the elites in, in Beijing uh, Crystal tell us a little bit you know you especially had a longer period in, in Japan and, and you know this has been beneficial for you I mean tell us maybe how does a long immersion like what you've done, how does it help you prepare you for doing what you're doing now? Because, I mean, it gives you certainly additional both credibility and maybe an ability to step into uh, the shoes, if you will, of those, you know, in this case, Japan. And that's so critical. We, you know, we can't always do that, and we can't assume we know exactly how they think. But uh, having spent many years there, it's fair to say you have a, at least a, a better understanding of how they think than looking at it from outside. So, sure. I think that spending a good amount of time in any foreign country is such an incredible experience and I feel so fortunate to have had that mm -hmm. opportunity and I definitely would not be where I am now without mm -hmm. having been able to experience that. Yeah. So I'm glad I just sort of followed my impulse which was to go to Japan and have fun and stay yes. there for a little bit longer and that, that it's led to this, this mm -hmm. career that I'm now yeah. in. I think the biggest thing perhaps is, is my grasp of the language and I spent many, many years mm -hmm. studying. I started at age 14 in mm -hmm. high school and continued basically for the next 10 years, studying yeah, pretty yeah. intensively. And because of that, I think that really gains you a new level of yeah. understanding and also yes. that people respect that. They respect mm -hmm. the effort that you've made, that you're yeah. able to talk with them. I'm talking with them about pretty technical things in a foreign language, which yeah. is never fun, but That's I think right. that, that because of that, I'm able to get information that otherwise would be basically inaccessible. And so yeah. I think to any degree to which we can go to a foreign country and also learn the language, I mean, that's yeah. just so, such a valuable, um, asset to have. Yeah. And I think, again, this language learning is so critical because while you might be interested in, you know, the technicalities of security or whatever it might be, um, understanding another culture's language is so critical. I, I certainly always tell my students, it's not just so that you can, you know, order something on a menu that's helpful and practical or if you have to ride the public transportation. To me, the language aspect, especially developing at a deeper level, is 
getting into the mindset. What are the things that matter to them? How do they see the world? What do they value most? And that, that's something you simply can't get from, even from translations in the same way, because a lot of times translations don't adequately reflect that. Moreover, in, in again, languages like Japanese, even Chinese, where you have a lot more nuances and you know, many ways of saying this or that, or how you treat a younger person and older, all of that says a lot about the culture uh, and, and, and you know, what they value. And, and again, with Japan, it's obviously part of the you know, Confucian ethic, filial piety, you respect elders, you treat them a certain way. Uh, my own heritage language of Spanish is very similar. I talk to a grandparent or to a you know, distinguished person in a different tense versus your you know, cousin or your friend. Uh, and you know, so language learning, critical for us to communicate on the one hand, but also to understand how people see the world. And, and, and I really commend both of you for that. I know maybe your Chinese is not as good as your Japanese, I'm not sure. Uh, but nevertheless, as you uh, reflect back on that and, and, and meeting with other people, I mean, are there, I don't know, anecdotes like when, you, when you've got your language, uh, obviously with Jap Japan, uh, how it opens a door when, when you can suddenly speak that and then, wow, people will see you very differently from somebody who obviously doesn't speak it. Uh, maybe any, any final thoughts on, you know, what the language has meant for you, uh, breaking barriers, um, any, anything uh, you could Sure. Share? So um, I'm bilingual, so I can mm -hmm. speak, uh, I speak Chinese at home, uh, Mandarin. Yes. And so when I go to China, um, it kind of is like a second language, mm -hmm. or it's actually a, like a native language to okay. me. Okay, yeah. Um, and you do, um, I guess, get to talk to more people that mm -hmm. way, especially the elderly. Mm -hmm. um, and they have such great stories, and mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Um, but moreover, the Chinese language itself is, of course, a very old language, mm -hmm. years of history also behind it. Yeah. So when you look at their classical literature, when you look at their poems, it's actually incredibly difficult to translate that into English at all. Yeah, yeah and convey the full meaning. Yeah, so I do think, yeah. as you say, it is very important to learn the language that, um, of the country that you're studying. Yeah, yeah. Anything you might add, again, you've, you've immersed yourself intensively in, in Japanese language. Like Chinese, not easy to learn, sure. takes many years of dedicated, but it helps open doors, right? It helps you Absolutely. see things in a different way. I think Japanese actually is not that hard to learn, the grammar mm -hmm. and, and yeah, that yeah. is not actually that hard, but the better you get, the harder <laughs> it is. It's one of those languages that the more nuances and the yes. more things you learn about it, it just gets increasingly complex. Yes. But I think some of the concepts, and just like you said, the, the concepts of the ideas, the ways of thinking, you really only can get via knowing yes, the language. Yes. Very important. Well, I want to thank both of you. It's been a great opportunity, and we'll have to bring you back to uh, dig a little deeper into some of your work, especially your both recent arrivals here at Pacific Forum, and, and perhaps uh, bring you back to talk a little bit more in de detail of the individual projects. Uh, but we've been joined today by two young leaders here who are research fellows at Pacific Forum, CSIS, and this is a Foreign Policy Research Center based in Honolulu. does a lot of important work at helping connect Hawaii to the world and the U.S. Uh, as a vital part of our uh, foreign policy establishment here. Uh, joined by Crystal Pryor, who is a doctoral student at the University of Washington, many years of work in Japan, and uh, now here in Hawaii to share some of her insights. And we're also joined by Miley Plan, who's a local girl, uh, came here from Hawaii, but uh, studies and work experience on the mainland, and has now come back. Uh, probably nice to be home, but also really uh, a next step in your uh, you know own professional development, and, and really grateful for these insights. Young perspectives, fresh perspectives, informed perspectives, and that's what we do here on Global Connections. You know, we try to bring the world to you here, and and that's what we've done today. I want to thank you, our listeners, for joining us. Uh, you can, of course, get copies of these on YouTube to share with your friends and family. Uh, please be sure to join us for our next episode of Global Connections. Uh, aloha. <laughs>